You want the basic myths. In my book I have ten chapters, so I have ten myths. But when I do meetings, I focus on just two. Um, the first one addresses what happened when Jewish settlers, mainly from Eastern Europe, went to Palestine and when they discovered that it wasn't a land without people, which is a major Zionist myth, it was a land full of people. That's the first major myth, it wasn't a land without people, there was a people, a native peasant population there which had farmed the land for centuries and the settler, whatever the, whatever the intention of the Jewish migrant settler, and many of them were, it is true, fleeing nasty, vicious anti-Jewish hatred, the pogroms under the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century. Still, there was a land full of people, and the settlers had two choices. Either they could work with the settlers to create a society for both groups, or they could become colonial masters over the settlers, and unfortunately most chose to choose, chose the latter course. They became essentially colonial masters. Um, so that's one myth. It wasn't a land without people. It became a colony. Zionism is effectively a Jewish colonial project. The second myth refers to the idea that Israel is a plucky little state faced by 22 Arab nations. Israel likes to claim it conducted the colonization of Palestine by itself, but that was never true. It always required what I call in my book a great power protege. And there's been two in the 20th century. The first one was Britain, sponsored the Jewish colony as part of the British Empire at the end of the First World War. And after the Second World War, America increasingly sponsored Israel, essentially as a kind of gendarme, as a policeman for its interests, uh, which Israel has willingly played. So I regard those two factors, those two myths, as the most important as two of the most important ways of understanding and making sense of what Zionism is about in the beginning of the 21st century. And when you, when you say for US policing their, um, their interest, uh, you mean in the Middle East? In the Middle East. I mean, first and foremost, Israel played its part in the Cold War as a, as a strategic American ally, but also, as Noam Chomsky has pointed out in his brilliant book, the main role of Israel was to protect the oil supplies, was to, was to weaken radical Arab nationalism and more recently Islamic radicalism as forces which could seize control of the world's still, it's one of the, it is still the main oil artery of global power um, and redirect what happens both in terms of the oil price, in terms of the oil flow, in terms of who gets oil. So it's a kind of oil policeman. Israel has played the role as an oil policeman in the second half of the 20th century. Well, bringing up uh, Noam Chomsky, I'm, I'm just reading actually his book, uh, Faithful Triangle. Yes, this is, this is the key book for this explanation. And, and he there even speaks of Israel's role for America in terms of selling Americans American weapons oh, yes, this to is actually dictatorships absolutely. in Africa and uh, fasc uh, then fascist uh, regimes in Latin America, like wh where where US couldn't sell it, it couldn't yeah. go through the parliament, yeah. uh, through the House of uh, Representatives, uh, they would get uh, Israel to sell it through it, sell it through Israel. Yeah. So this way they were supporting, for example, uh, Se uh, Seco in um, uh, in Congo. Yeah. Is that so. Yeah. All this is true. I mean, Israel has both sold weapons on America's behalf, but also Israel tests weapons in most of its major conflicts. In Lebanon in 1982 and in Gaza last year, Israel tested American weaponry. Okay, uh, can I ask you one more question? Uh, was there an element of fascism in uh, the beginning of uh, Zionist movement? This is, if you're referring to, well, there's two, there's two aspects to this. You, we mentioned before you began this interview, Lenny Brenner. Mm -hmm. Lenny Brenner wrote a very important book called The Zionism in the Age of the Dictators. But in my opinion, and I criticize it in my own book, he slightly overstated his case. It is true that when Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, the Zionist Federation of Germany welcomed Hitler to power. It w and, and historically, Zionism has, in Herzl's words, the founder of Zionism, uh, uh, said it understood anti-Semitism, said it agreed very often there were too many Jews in Europe and it appealed to uh, fascist and conservative uh, nationalist and racist politicians to help uh, Zionists get Jews out of Europe to Palestine. All that is true. 
that's not quite the same thing as saying Zionism itself is a form of fascism. Zionism is more accurately described as a peculiar form of colonialism. It's not strictly speaking fascist. And of course, once it became clear that the Nazis had an exterminationist program, even the most right-wing Zionist was as much a potential victim of Hitler as a left-wing Zionist or no Zionist. I mean, the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, before the Warsaw Ghetto was deported to the death camps, there were religious Jews, there were socialist Jews, and there were Zionist Jews. The Nazis didn't distinguish between them. So one has to be a bit careful about how we discuss this, and I think that um, this is the way to discuss it, the way I've just said. I was, I was, more, I was talking, yes, about Lenny Brenner's work, but I was more thinking of the point he makes in the book uh, called uh, 51 Documents uh, of Zionist uh, Cooperation with Hitler, uh, where he actually uh, says that uh, a group of Zionists around Jabotinsky was trained in Mussolini, Mussolini's Navy Academy. You know, that, that, that is true. There are some right-wing Zionists. Jabotinsky is the most famous. Uh, Jabotinsky was a Mussolini supporter, uh, but Jabotinsky did have some conception of a kind of black shirt, of a kind of fascistic uh, type of movement. In that sense, that is true, yes. And then, even if you go by quotes from uh, Ben Gurion... Uh, well, ben Gurion was part of that movement also. Yeah. Ben Gurion yeah, was also part of that movement. But, yeah. but, but, but again, um, there, these, these political movements, when they became official parties in Israel after 1948, it would be mistaken to call them fascist in a European sense. Mm. Because the, the gap between them and the so-called Zionist Labour Party isn't that big. But Zionist Labour and uh, Likud Labour, Likud La uh, sorry, Li Zionist Likud, which is uh, the movement of Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, sorry, not Ben Gurion, uh, Begin. Um, before Menachem Begin, before the Second World War, those parties that became Likud after the Second World War, the gap between them and Labour Zionism isn't so great. It's, it's, they have a different way of excluding Palestinians. They have a different way of managing the Palestinian problem. But they are essentially, Zionism is essentially, in both its left and right wing form, a, an exclusionist movement of Palestinians. But wouldn't, wouldn't you say that the movement around uh, Jabotinsky and Gurion uh, was more, had more influence uh, on establishing Israel uh, in its first days? Well, but, 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 but Jabotinsky was always an outsider. Ben Gurion was central. Ben Gurion didn't belong to Jabotinsky's party. Ben Gurion belonged to Labour Zionism throughout his life. Mm -hmm. Um, but so ben Gurion, for example, said that if he had a choice uh, to make, if to save all the children from Holocaust, he did say that. He did say that. Uh, in some country in Europe or or uh, in uh, Palestine uh, to establish Israel and save just half of the children, he'd rather make yes, the second true. choice. Yes, that's true. He did say that, and that is a fascistic statement. In that sense, that's true.